Rick and Mark and everyone and the folks at the BPA program and the folks at SFU for inviting me here today. I'm very honored. Um, I'm going to begin by letting the young people I work with uh, and some of the staff speak for themselves. I'm going to show a very short section of my documentary that premiered at DOXA in 2012 entitled Stock Characters The Cooking Show. Uh, then we'll turn the sound down and we'll continue to play footage from various uh, projects and various documentaries that are in process or that are, have already been released. And you'll watch the images rather than just my talking head delivering this talk. Okay, so... Okay, look at your positions. Look at your positions. I didn't really have a stable childhood at all and I had to kind of raise myself. My biggest challenge was my mom. She didn't believe that I was coming here. She probably thought I was going to do drugs or something. Go on, get your mom. I didn't have anything to look forward to. So I was just kind of running around the streets with my friends and drinking. Rather than facing front, you're facing this way. It's just growing up in East Vancouver, you know? Lots of people have it bad. You know, you just gotta do, do what you can with what you got, you know? Hit your positions. I experienced the dysfunctional family, not fitting in when growing up, and not knowing why. Okay, let's try it. Let's go. I felt like such an outsider. Okay, look where center is. I just marked center. Elaine is a benevolent drill sergeant. I've been told I have 20 minutes to talk about two very complex themes, childhood and creativity. Two, contact, two concepts that, in the context of my work, are contradictions, full of contradictions, and ripe for rigorous interrogation. As a result, I ask live audience and viewers to please bear with me and understand that this is really too short a time to provide a cogent analysis and talk about my work in the context of these hot topics. However, I will do my best. I rarely refer to creativity, but rather call my work what it is, art. I also never refer to childhood. It's a loaded term that, for the youth we work with, means little or nothing. All these words have been too often gentrified, colonized, and commodified in order to benefit a privileged few that already hold too much power. I believe in art in everyday life for all people, especially in the context of community. And what does community really mean? It has become such a nebulous term, and yet those of us that live and work in diverse communities, especially challenged communities, believe that this word should encompass more than just a geographic area or a group of like-minded people, but rather should include an element of empowerment, healthy transformation, a sense of belonging, a shared sacred space of honoring our art, 
art being the driving force, the vehicle and instrument of change. Most youth I work with have had little or no access to art and professional artists. I was lucky. As a working class kid that grew up in the Trudeau era of the 1960s and 70s in Pierre's own writing, there were many opportunities to access the arts. This is not the case now. The first time I fell in love with theater and performance was when I was four years old, being raised by my maternal working class Ashkenazi grandfather and Sephardic Mitzraki grandmother, living in their house with my mother, who was often absent, or more likely with one of her boyfriends. My grandparents were immigrants and trade unionists and ran a small business out of our home in Montreal. They worked all the time in order to uh, support my mother and me. When I turned four, they needed affordable and accessible childcare. Across the street was a Quebecois Catholic nursery school run by nuns, Notre Dame de Sion. I have fond memories of being one of two Jewish kids that went to this school. The nuns pretty much left us non-Catholics to our own devices, and I don't remember any cruelty towards any of the students. It all seemed really calm and peaceful at that nursery school. It was a sanctuary from my highly dysfunctional, violent, and complicated family. The clearest memory I have of my young life was when two teachers stapled a flower tutu costume made out of a wooden hoop, cardboard, and sheets and sheets and sheets of crepe paper, colorful, beautiful, together with me inside this fabulous fabrication, being directed to go center stage for the school play and give a, a performance as a flower drinking up the sun's rays. Well, I thought this was the most marvelous moment of my entire young life, to perform as a flower thriving on a sunny day. I grew and grew and shone and glowed. My stupendous performance as a mixed race, working class Jewish flower set the house ablaze with applause. And that was it. I knew then the life of the theater was the life for me. Now, many years later, I live and work in East Vancouver in an amazing charitable nonprofit arts organization unique in Canada. Miss Ladies Productions is a 14 year old community engaged arts organization that serves and collaborates with culturally and socially diverse, multi-barriered youth to create interdisciplinary performance with an emphasis on live theater, performance art, hip hop music and dance, world music and documentary film. We bring in teams of professional artists, technicians, social workers, educators, counseling and social psychologists to collaborate on long-term projects with young people. Miscellaneous Productions work is more plainly described as glee with grit, a theater boot camp for inner city youth that live with grave challenges. Most have grown up way too fast and know little of the idyllic notion of childhood. We merge high art, community development, and popular culture to create and present issue-based works of art. The main focus of our interdisciplinary practice is one in which young participants use their own oral histories to create original plays and performances. At Miscellaneous Productions, we work closely on a very long-term basis with youth who, have, who each have two or more of the following risk factors. That is, they are culturally and socially diverse and have multiple barriers. First and second generation immigrants to Canada, youth from communities of color, indigenous Aboriginal youth, secondary school students, youth enrolled in alternative school programs, youth currently not in school, multi-barriered youth, that is, at-risk and experiential youth, un- and underemployed and working youth, low-income youth, street-involved, formerly street-involved youth, youth living without a fixed address, youth in care, foster children, youth who are survivors of wars and violent oppressive regimes or who have parents who are survivors of wars and violent oppressive regimes, young people in the illegal drug subculture as users, dealers, and drug mules, mules, drug mules or young people struggling with addictions. Youth attracted, <coughs> pardon me, youth attracted to or affiliated with gangs or those trying to exit gangs. 
youth at risk for gang violence, youth involved with the criminal justice system or on parole, youth who have been physically and sexually abused, sexually exploited youth, youth with mental health issues or who have parents with mental health issues, youth coping with, su so, uh, youth coping with suicidal ideation or who have attempted suicide, youth being forced into arranged marriages, GLBTIQ youth. I'm openly lesbian, I'm an openly queer person, so uh, we do tend every year to get more and more queer youth coming to our group. Youth with adults in their lives who are struggling with addictions, poverty, racism, and violence. Youth struggling with family distress. Youth with learning and developmental disabilities. Outsider youth. There are many complex ethical issues that we, include, that we encounter in our work, including the need to ensure that our work does not exploit the experiences of youth participants, but rather empowers them to create their own self-representations and to, uh, to acquire skills and knowledge that will be relevant to them in long-term concrete ways. The implications of youth publicly representing their personal experiences of the legacy of the residential school system and the big scoop, the big 60s scoop, fleeing war-torn homelands as refugees, addiction, gangs, and criminal activity, if not carefully considered, can have serious impact on the personal safety or emotional well-being of the youth. The need for representations of characters and situations that counter stereotypes. Can this be achieved by creating complex, realistic, and often contradictory characters? How do we assist youth in honest self-representation and yet also deal directly with the challenges that they face in their daily lives. This is from Cuts and Dogs. This was commissioned by the Vancouver International Children's Festival. It was uh, Hip Hop, Romeo and Juliet with Alley Cats and Junkyard Dogs. It premiered at the Kids Fest, not this past year, but the year before, and then went on tour of BC. And I think actually it was, our, it was one of our best pieces. Ethics is something that is rarely discussed when it comes to artists working with children and youth, especially those artists that seek to gentrify community-engaged practice in order to grab funding dollars, boosting their careers rather than the self-esteem of the young people that are supposed to be at the center of their artistic practice. Currently, we are working on two projects. We are completing the feature-length documentary film, Power, that I began to shoot in 2009, about the challenges of our collaboration with culturally and socially diverse, multi-barriered youth to make solo, duo, and ensemble performances in styles that include the theatrical monologue, stand-up and sketch comedy, rap, spoken word, performance art, ritual performance, hip-hop and contemporary dance, Latin American drumming, hip-hop and salsa music. Each young person was asked to explore the concept of power for our first cabaret performance, and I'll show you some footage of that at the end. We presented power throughout the region in 2009-2010 in non-traditional spaces, such as youth centers, neighborhood cafes, street festivals, and a major commercial hip-hop showcase at the Michael J. Fox Theatre. The other project we are currently developing is entitled Haunted House in collaboration with our most at-risk group of young people to date. I have been living and working in low-income communities my whole life, and I have never, ever seen such a dire situation for children and youth in East Van as I have over the past few years. Levels of violence and poverty are out of control, and those that deeply care about young people do not have the funding or tools to deal with the great, great mis misfortunes of our community. It was out of this appalling circumstance for youth in East Van that I created Haunted House, which uses art as a vehicle to confront the things that scare us most deeply, about how naming our fears and telling stories about them can empower us to overcome that which haunts us. Like our past projects, Haunted House will put youth, will put young people front and center with professionals in the collaborative artistic process. Haunted House will feature site-specific performance art taking place in and around an old Vancouver house. Each youth participant will be assigned a room, a limited budget, and professional artists to collaborate with to create a performance work in which they face their fears, that which haunts them. To be clear, 
the final product, the final product, the final production and public presentation will not be a typical campy Halloween haunted house. Rather, this haunted house will be a candid examination of the fears of the youth we work with, many of whom are haunted, again, by the images of the legacy of the residential school system and the big 60s scoop. Violence and war in their homelands, of child soldiers brainwashed and chemically intoxicated on excessive brutality, horrific torture and deaths of family members, memories of kidnappings, gangs, homophobic bullying in their schools and communities, deportations. In fact, I just want to interject here that originally we were going to focus power on a youth who was facing deportation with her family. Um, and we, we, in that Project Power, we did lose two youth to deportation and one who fought successfully to stay in Canada with her family. We were going to focus that documentary of power on this family, but they are way too afraid to become public about the, their history in Latin America. Um, they're afraid that the gang members in Latin America will go after the relatives that live there so we she's dropped out of the video the the documentary with her family and i totally understand why and i would never ever want to put them in any kind of danger their relatives in any kind of danger so we're focusing on about six or seven other youth from the power project i did want to talk about the refugee system in canada uh, very much but it's not going to be in this documentary we're going to touch on it and we're going to talk about the two youth with their families that were deported um, and are in hiding in their homelands in Latin America right now, uh, but we can't uh, go into it in any great detail in, in this particular documentary. The professional artistic team will expertly and sensitively guide youth participants through a curriculum of famous international horror films centered in haunted houses documentary films about artists that face their fears in their work as they grapple with their own hauntings, such as Never Sorry about artist Ai Weiwei, and other concepts and influences intended to awaken, inform, and inspire young performers. There will also be ensemble group work using urban art forms, experimental theater, performance art, hip-hop music, and dance. So in the light of all this, what is the most respectful way to discuss childhood and, and childhood and creativity without exploiting youth participants? How do I honor them without reducing their experience to a sound bite? Powerful, strong, sharp. We are at the Broadway Fraser Corridor in East Vancouver. Next to the downtown east side, this is the second most low income community in all of Canada. There's a much larger population of youth that live in this community than in the downtown east side. Our mission is to give access to young people to the arts who would not normally have this access. We auditioned in January. We had enormous call. Slowing down, exaggerated. 50 youth applied and auditioned. We chose 21 youth. Well, there's 20 in the room, and I said I would cast 20. So you're all cast. Our work keeping the youth off the streets and out of their gangs 
and away from the drugs is not only more creative, but potentially life-saving. Every Monday, every Friday from 4 till 8 p.m., we'll be working in this room. Coming late is not an option. I need you to be clear, no drugs or alcohol 24 hours before any rehearsal. Healthy snacks, no sugary drinks, no junk food, three to four hours before Roberto is living a very intense life right now. He's definitely been out of the street life and off drugs, basically since he's been with our program which is great news, and he talks about it in his performance piece, In Power. I used to live in El Salvador before I came to Canada. Lived in a shithole. When he first came to us, he was a very tough, angry young person. Drugs. Why not try it once? What harm could it do? Three hits? Four hits? Five. We're trying to work with him to find his gentler side, and we have since we've started working with him. I mean, I, I now think of him as quite a gentle young man, but he, it's been a real journey uh, for him. Are you too good to help someone in need? Maybe you think you are. I used to be in need. I wish someone would help me. I don't anymore. Will you make someone's wish come true? I was playing a forbidden game against my opposite, and I would make my moves recklessly if I knew I didn't have far to fall. She's had a tough time this year. She's been on and off the streets. She's been in and out of a relationship with a gang member who is also a drug dealer. At the height of the game, I got lost, and the board was clear. She's had a few relationships with these bad boyfriends, as I like to call them. I lost the game I wanted, and I stopped caring about my next move. She will push the envelope just to the point where she can really do herself in. And then she, by some grace of God, or being she gets pulled out or she snaps out of it. The more she started engaging with him, the more she started losing herself. This lifestyle was soon filled with alcohol and a never-ending supply of drugs. She knew she had to get out and she made it out of there, leaving with so many chaotic thoughts. She's missed more rehearsals than any other youth, but we continue to work with her because we deeply believe in her talent. Michael Cheng is living with Asperger's Syndrome. It's a developmental disability. I like the way he describes himself as having an eccentric aura. And then just move it and let the stick bounce. He's so attentive and so he's got such a commitment to whatever he does, which I find is like really refreshing in youth. <laughs> He's very particular, and yes, he has his needs and the way he needs things laid out for him. It's like he's a, a conductor's dream come true. Because it might take him two or three sessions to get this agul go pattern, but once he's got it, man, he's got it. Mm -hmm. And I'll never have to teach that to him again. My learning curve is more extreme than my peers. I wonder if I have any unforeseen challenges when trying to pick up subtle social cues which are a root of human interaction. I've learned more about myself and I've learned more about teaching performance from him than anybody. My brain is wired differently. Therefore, I interpret information in a unique fashion. I am proud of who I am in all my uniqueness my difference, my eccentric aura. Thank you. Another young person that we're working with in our company is Natasha Faco. Some rapper is throwing a thousand words a second at me. 
He spits out something about a woman's body and ten women dance onto the screen, wearing almost nothing. She is writing very I much about her experience of sexism and racism. She has true potential to become a professional. I'm your Bariki Fresh, African Canadian, hip hop, East Vancouver, fairy godmother. Hola, <laughs> quien eres? And we have to keep no, reminding ourselves that she's only 14 years old because she has amazing analytical powers. So to stand down, put your guns away, and we can all live together in a brighter day. So to stand down, listen to our song. People don't want war, we all want to belong. But we fight about color, religion too, how people look, they speak, dress. What can we do to stop all this crap? This earth is what we share. Some people so unaware of the racism out there. Don't judge me, because I'm not the same. Hey, I'm about to take sacrifice. Sometimes, if something occurs to me that might sound clever, and she didn't ask the speaker what I should ask them. So, I would love to know, uh, Elaine, to how, when you're going through this creative process, like these, I work with kids, I teach, how does that process work when you're working with youth, especially these youth? Mm -hmm. How do you go through the creative process? What does that look like? Well, it's different from project to project, and it's not cookie cutter. Like, I'm really adamant that we not come up with, like, a singular process for each uh, group and each individual young person. So, uh, where there's more solo work uh, concerned, as in a project like Power or Haunted House, there's more individual attention. When we're doing a more ensemble piece, like Stock Characters or Cuts and Dogs, uh, there's another approach there. Usually what we do is, uh, you know, you saw a little bit of the audition process. We audition the youth, uh, they come in, and then there's a pretty rigorous, it is theater boot camp because it's a no-nonsense approach, and they have to show up on time, we feed them. There's, a, there's always a youth worker or a therapist in the room. We all, I, I think it's really important if you're working with at-risk youth, that you have a counselor present and that your staff be trained in counseling. We have a, a lot, I have support on my board, I have a counseling psychologist on my board of directors who's been really involved, I have a social worker on my board who's really involved, and then we also hire either social workers or youth counselors to be in the room so that there's that, there's that support for them. Um, and then there's training. For instance, in Cuts and Dogs, we had a, that, there's a really good example. I came in all prepared to adapt West Side Story. Because uh, in our, we had done uh, a couple of years of outreach and free workshops in the community, and youth were telling us, oh, they loved West Side Story, especially the Latin American youth we work with, and we have big connections to Latin American youth. So I came into rehearsal number one and training number one, all prepared to work on the adaptation of Romeo and Juliet, West Side Story. Well, the youth who we ended up casting as Romeo, Gustavo Diaz de Leon, who uh, was also in power and then came to play our Romeo, Ruffio, we called him Ruffio, um, he said to me at, at one of the early rehearsals, why are you doing an adaptation? I mean, he's a really smart, smart, smart young person. Why are you doing an adaptation of an adaptation? Why don't we just work from the source material? Why don't we just work from Romeo and Juliet? So I threw everything out and we went back to the Shakespeare, which was, it was incredible to work from that original source material. And I thought in the end more freeing, but you have to really, I think if you're really a community engaged artist, and I think there's a few of you in the room, you have to really respond to what the group requests. You can't come in and impose 
uh, a structure, well, maybe a structure for learning, but you can't impose the, the fashion in which you're going to <coughs> nurture them. Um, but we do have a rigorous, rigorous process, for instance, in Cuts and Dogs, there's a lot of circus training, there was a lot of dance training, voice, speech, singing, acting, script writing. I mean, that was, uh, to come up with a, a new ending for Romeo and Juliet uh, that was relevant to a contemporary audience, that was a huge uh, process for us. So each process is different, each process is geared to the youth we're working with. In stock characters, those youth were one of our most, if not our most challenged group of youth. So we had to really, um, we had to work closely with indigenous community, we had to work with the elders. We worked with a man very closely who uh, unfortunately passed on, Cass Thompson, who was um, one of the great youth victim support workers for Aboriginal youth in East Van. So we worked really closely with all these people in order to support uh, the Indigenous youth. And to this day, I'm still really close, very, very close to Dakota Prince, who you saw, in, and uh, she's now an AIDS educator at Youth Co. And uh, we just attended a meeting, uh, was it yesterday or the day was fair? This week has been a little crazy. Sometime this week, we attended a meeting to support youth in the community. So I'm now bringing her to meetings uh, with me. And uh, we have uh, trained a lot of our youth to become youth leaders, and we've employed them in subsequent years. Uh, some of the beats that you heard in power were composed by Kuru Matsushita, who's now at CalArts. And uh, she was a youth in our first two projects, and then I brought her back because she's such a good composer. But she's studying visual arts at CalArts, so <laughs> she's super talented. Who has a question for our guest? There's one back here. Uh, a question that came up in our group, um, actually there were two, two questions that were most important. One was, how do you find the youth that you work with? And the second was, what happens to the ones that don't make it in the audition? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and actually, it's a qu that's one of the most asked questions. How do we go about finding the youth? We spend usually uh, probably about 18 months doing outreach to, I have a, by now, it's been 14 years with the organization, so we have kind of a set group that we go to in the community. So we, do, we go to Community GAV, which is the queer youth group. We, we work with Covenant House. We work with, we're very close to the Britannia Center, that's our neighborhood. Um, we work with Broadway Youth Resource Center. So we, we're working at the schools, we work with a lot of the East Van schools. So we'll go into the schools, we'll give a free hip hop dance workshop, a theater workshop, uh, the community uh, gab group, they really like our writing workshops. So we'll, uh, we're gonna be going to do, uh, I'm bringing in a group called Public Secrets. They're really great young gamelan musicians uh, who have taken bicycle parts and fashioned them into gamelan instruments. They're fantastic. And they've worked at the Kids Fest and um, so we'll be bringing them into Covenant House because Covenant House wants to do some percussion. Uh, so we do a lot of these free workshops in the community and it also gives us a chance to get to know the different young people in the community and then we invite all of them to come down and audition and we also do like massive outreach. We found that taking an ad out in the 24 hours brings us really interesting youth. So that's one way of getting youth. Uh, so that's but mostly it's the outreach to the uh, East Vancouver organizations and the downtown south side organizations, family services, uh, dawn till dusk. So serving, we go out and serve those organizations. We get to know the youth in the community. With some really, really challenged youth, I'm working with our most challenged group of youth to date right now in East Van. Um, I haven't even come in with a workshop yet. I've just been hanging around the youth center, their barbecues. I showed them the whole stock characters. And uh, it was a very moving experience with these young people because I think they saw a lot of themselves and the youth uh, in that film. And uh, we're going to be going in with a hip hop dance and theater workshop coming up. So that's one way that we do outreach and get to know youth in the community. And, 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 and I'm, I'm interested also in the youth that you know, aren't the lead in their high school theater pieces, the, the ones that don't get cast. In Cuts and Dogs, uh, a lot of those youth who were so fantastic in Cuts and Dogs 
they were not cast in their high school musical. And then when they came to us, I, I couldn't figure out why, but I think that there's, uh, I still, we, I think with the teachers in, this is what I'm hearing from the youth, with the teachers in the school system, we need to do more anti-racism work because I think that that's uh, quite a problem. Like, I, Natasha Paco was never cast as the lead in her school play, which I think is just crazy, because uh, she certainly was the lead in our, in our piece. So, and, and she's going to be one of the leading characters in the film. So, I think that that that's, the kids that, that don't, it's really interesting, the kids that either don't make it through the audition, they're harder because we just don't have the staff capacity we just don't have the, f we, we're constantly having problems with funding. Funding is our biggest issue, always. You know, we can work with the most at-risk youth, the most culturally challenged youth in, in, in town, no problem. But funding is the big issue. So we don't have like an outreach worker that can follow those youth. Uh, what I do try to do, and this I take on personally, is after we've cast some youth, we tend to get half like I, I cast 20 in power, we went down I think to 11. That's pretty standard, we lose, lose half the cast. I try to track the, the youth that we've cast that drop out, but that again isn't always possible. Um, but I am in touch with a, there was a really great young person who was cast in the original Cuts and Dogs, who had to leave our group because his mother gambled all of his money away. Uh, she had access to his, he was a little bit of an older youth. It was terrible. It was a terrible situation. So we lost this incredibly talented young guy to gambling, to his mother's gambling. And uh, I've been in touch with him because I, you know, I'm really hoping that he goes back to school. Um, so it's a little bit harder with the youth that drop out or the youth that we, we didn't cast to begin with because of, of funding. It's a funding issue. How often do you have to boot? people out of the program because they broke some of the guidelines we heard you talking about. I think about. in the 14 years we've only had to ask four people to leave. We so these, these, these kids who live very loose lives. Not all they, of them, some of them. To generalize, they show up, they, they, they stick to your schedule, they follow those rules, they come. Well, <laughs> well. I can't even show up things on time. One of the things, one of the things the assistant directors do is we, we buy them all journals and we buy them all day timers and we teach them how to use them. So that's one, that's almost the first thing we do with them is time management. Um, now they're all, they all, even the most low income youth tends to have a, a smartphone of some kind. So now we're working, uh, we don't necessarily have to buy the day timers anymore because they seem to all have it on their smartphones. But um, my staff are way more technically savvy than I am and uh, they've been teaching them how to keep their day timers on their smartphones. Uh, and then journaling is a, a bit of a separate uh, thing that we do with them. We're a little, running a little long in time because your answers are amazing. So if you have one or two quick questions we can do. Yeah. Hi, uh, it sounds like a lot of the youth come from a really mixed background and you have the refugees, people from drugs or sexual abuse, whatever it might be. How do you manage what conflict, which I imagine is a little bit inevitable or needs that come up from that? You mean conflicts within their own lives or conflict within the group? Within the group because they're such an eclectic mix of... Well, you know what's really groups. interesting is we haven't had conflict within, like, really serious conflict within the group since 2005 when we did a piece in Richmond called E-Race, which was about speeding young lives. Um, there was definitely conflict in that group, and it was basically two guys over one of the young women. <laughs> so, we did the best we could in that, and Esther O worked on that, thank God, because she's the greatest, she's a great social worker, and uh, so we were able to manage that. But they did have a screaming match at one point, um, the, the two young men, and um, I just let them, actually, in that particular circumstance. We haven't had serious conflict within the group itself in quite a while. What we're seeing now is they found a new community, and they found, like, uh, Roberto says in stock characters later in the film, he says, you know, here I am with a bunch of people that are just like me. Um, so they tend to become quite, uh, quite close. In fact, uh, in Cuts and Dogs, the original Ruffio, Romeo, Gustavo Diaz de Leon and Rowan, uh, who played Juliet, Juliet, they've been a couple, they've been seeing each other 
since just at the end of the Children's Festival. So I knew when they came in for audition, I knew there was a lot of chemistry between them. But now they're, they've been in a relationship now for almost two years. So um, sometimes it's more likely there's conflict with me because uh, I am the safe mother. Don't they call you the benevolent dictator? Drill sergeant. The benevolent drill sergeant. Drill sergeant. I wish I was a dictator. Come, I make things easier. Oh, no. You can open that. Yeah. Does somebody else have a follow-up question? Okay. Hi. Thank you so much for speaking to us today. Um, my question is um, relates to maybe your greatest success story with an individual. You said you've been doing this for 14 years, so we were sort of talking about it and curious what someone's initial barriers were and, and where they've come to in their lives now. I don't know if there's one, uh, one great success, and it's, it's really complicated because it's just like somebody going into rehab. The first time you go into a rehab situation, you won't necessarily become clean. It might take two or three tries. So with a lot of the youth that are uh, facing more risk factors, we try to get them to come back for a few projects. Uh, we've had youth come back to up to three projects with us. So that's like a six, seven year uh, relationship that we have with them. Um, I think that there have been a lot of really great successes over the years with individuals and groups, but it hasn't always been steady. Like you'll have a youth who does really well with you and then really well their first year out of the program, but then they go back to a bad boyfriend who ends up doing something really horrible to them. And then there's a whole bunch of other issues to deal with on the other end. So it's not necessarily a steady incline up. It's, it's a process, it goes up and down. It's really complex. Um, I'm still, I'm at, I think I'm at a period now where I'm trying to, I'm, just, I'm so busy right now, it's, but it's, I'm trying to, before I go in to shoot the last bit of power, I'm trying to assess a lot of these issues that you're, and questions that you're bringing up. And it's sometimes hard to gain distance. Um, we have definitely seen a lot of youth go on to theater school, music school, film school, engineering, microbiology. Uh, we've seen them go on to all kinds of things. And we've also seen youth who stay in more working class but are making like $35 an hour at age 19, they're car mechanics but they're not gang members anymore. So I mean, how do you really measure that? And we work with a social psychologist, Dr. George Chen, who I really love, who's been donating uh, evaluation services to us since the beginning. And he helps us to evaluate, you know, how well are we actually doing? Uh, are we making an impact? But there's also so many other factors in their lives because, you know, if they're in foster care and that's not going well, if they don't have you know, a fixed place to live. Often, I see if their parents uh, aren't doing well, they're not doing well. Uh, a lot depends, and, and there's only so much we can control because we're there to advocate for the youth. We're not there to, to advocate for their parents. Um, though I have become close with a number of parents over the years, though a number of parents over the years really don't like me, you know, but, uh, you know, I can't be all things to all people. So, I think that the greatest success is that we're still here, you know, and I think that our greatest, like I said, our greatest challenge is funding, especially public funding. Uh, we actually seem to have a bit of an easier time, quite, we have, uh, quite a, we have to still prove ourselves year after year, but uh, the private sector, especially funders like TELUS, have been re really, really good to us. People like Nene Baird in the community have been really, really good to us. Um, but with public funding, it's so political and it's so, there's so much political interference in funding right now um, and incompetence. Uh, and yet, as an arts group, we can't be, at, we can't slip in any way, shape, or form or we'll lose funding. So we're constantly fighting for funding. Um. We'll have to leave it there. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you.